Jesus Raises Lazarus from the Dead. That's the title that we've been given for today, October the 22nd, day 22 of our series of video messages of 31 Days with Jesus. <clears throat> so Jesus Raises Lazarus from the Dead. And the scripture we've been given is from the Gospel of John. Almost the entirety, well, the majority of chapter 11 of John, to be specific, verse 1 through to verse 44. John chapter 11, verse 1 through to verse 44, Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead. Now a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. And it was the Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. The sisters therefore sent to him, that's Jesus, saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. Well, just a passing reference here to the different sorts of verbs which there are in the Greek language to love. And the word whom you love here is philio, the one whom you are fond of, the one for whom you have affection. It wasn't the normal love which we associate with the Lord Jesus and which is used frequently in scripture about the love of God, agapeo, to love, or the agape love. This was a different love, filio, the love of fondness or affection. But when Jesus heard it, he said, this sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified by it. Now Jesus loved Martha, love, and here is the agapeo, the divine type of love, love that does something about itself. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. When therefore he heard that he was sick, he stayed there, he stayed then two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this he said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you, and you are going there again? See, the disciples there were still um, <clears throat> thinking on a, on a human level, if you like, on a horizontal plane rather than on the vertical, because it didn't matter where Jesus went. It didn't matter who confronted him. It didn't matter the odds, as we might say, that were against him. His time had not yet arrived for him to fulfil the ultimate will of the Father, to, which was to give his life on the cross at Calvary, to die, to take our sins upon himself, to allow his blood to be shed, so that to, to provide forgiveness for those who put their faith and trust in what the Lord Jesus did and who he is. That time hadn't arrived, so Jesus didn't mind where he went. But the disciples hadn't, hadn't grasped that yet, and they were thinking, well, why go back into the danger zone? Verse 9, Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. This he said, and after that he said to them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go so that I may awaken him out of sleep. The disciples therefore said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will recover. Jesus was using the word sleep, as so often the Bible uses the word to fall asleep or sleeping, um, as being, uh, as, as, as passing away. So Jesus here was saying to them, Lazarus has actually died, but I'm going to go so that I may awaken him out of his death. I may bring him back to life. The disciples Again, maybe we can understand why they were thinking along this level. They thought, well, if he's fallen asleep, well, surely, yes, he'll wake up again. No problem. Now, Jesus had spoken of his death, that's Lazarus's death. But they thought that he was speaking of literal sleep, which is what I've just said. Then Jesus, therefore, said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. 
and I am glad for your sakes that I was not there, so that you may believe, but let us go to him. That word believe there, or the verb believe, trust, have confidence in, place reliance upon. Jesus was glad that he wasn't there when Lazarus had died, because there would have been an expectation there and then, this is how I understand it, for Jesus to have done something about it there and then. But we'll find out very shortly from the text, and we know that why Jesus took his time. And we know that having been told that Lazarus was uh, dead, he said, um, or Lazarus was sick, he said, well, well, we'll go to Judea again. Jesus was not in a hurry because he knew what needed to be done. And what needed to be done was going to be for the glory of God. And it needed Lazarus to die in order to be brought back to life again, resurrected for the glory of God. So Lazarus is dead and I'm glad for your sakes that I was not there so that you may believe and trust. But let us go to him. Thomas, therefore, who was called Didymus, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go so that we may die with him. Thomas is still thinking that they, well, a commendable attitude of Thomas there. He was thinking that Jesus was going to go to Judea. The Jews had tried to capture him there to kill him. Therefore, if Jesus was going to Judea, the, the likelihood was that he would be captured and killed. And Thomas was sticking close to the Lord Jesus and saying, well, if I'll go where Jesus goes, if Jesus goes there and is captured and killed, let us also go there so that we may die with him. We may die with Jesus. Well, that's a commendable attitude. But still, Thomas was not understanding the deity of Jesus and the authority which Jesus had over death. The authority which Jesus had over time, as we call it. And as I've said, the time was not right for Jesus to give up his life. So when Jesus came, he found that he, that's Lazarus, he found that he had already been in the tomb four days. Four days, definitely dead. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. Martha, therefore, when she heard that Jesus was coming, went to meet him, but Mary still sat in the house. Martha, therefore, said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. A bit of mixed messages there from Martha, I'm going to suggest, because verse 21 there, Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. So seemingly, I don't know, maybe could we interpret it like this, that she was blaming Jesus for the death of her brother? Well, people do blame God for all sorts of things. They blame God for suffering in the world. They, yeah, I won't, the, latest, the list is almost endless. So it could be read here that Martha was blaming Jesus, saying, Lord, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. So why weren't you here? Why did you delay in coming? But then in verse 22, she says, showing some faith here, she says, even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. That's good. So she started in verse 21, maybe on a bit of a down note, down beat, but then... Verse 22 is uplifting because she acknowledged that whatever the Lord Jesus would ask of God, God would grant that prayer. Jesus said to her, your brother shall rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me shall live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? That was, a, that was a question that Jesus posed to Martha. But do you believe this? I can pose that question to you, whoever you are watching this particular video message. Do you believe that Jesus is the resurrection and the life? And that whoever 
believes, there's that verb again, trusts, places their confidence in, places reliance upon. Whoever believes and trusts in Jesus shall live even though they die. But and everyone who lives and believes in Jesus shall never die. Shall never die spiritually. Do you believe this? Martha's response was this in verse 27. She said to him, yes, Lord, I have believed that you are the Christ, the son of God, even he who comes into the world. A bit like Peter when in Matthew uh, chapter 16, I think, verse 18. Let me quickly turn to it. I hadn't intended to, but as it comes to mind, Matthew chapter 16. Yeah, it's actually verse 15. Matthew 16, verse 15. Jesus said to them, but who do you say that I am? That's the question, isn't it? That's This is the acid test. Who do you say? Who do people say individually? Not their parents, not their friends, not their teachers, not the clergy in, in a church setting, if we like. Who do you say that the Son of Man is? And Jesus said, sorry, and Peter said, chapter 16, verse 16, you are, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. That's what it reminded me of when Martha here said, in going back to John chapter 11, she said, yes, Lord, I have believed that you are the Christ, the Son of God, and even he who, overcome, who comes into the world. And when she had said this, she went away and called Mary, her sister, saying secretly, The teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, she arose quickly and was coming to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still in the place where Martha met him. The Jews who were with her in the house and consoling her when they saw that Mary rose up quickly and went out, followed her supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep there. Therefore, when Mary came where Jesus was, she saw him and fell at his feet, saying, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. That's familiar, isn't it? Because that's what Martha had said further up my page, further or previously in John chapter 11, as we've just read. But she fell at his feet, which was an act of submission, adoration, worship. Yet she said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Maybe she was thinking that the Lord Jesus, when Lazarus was sick, he would have prayed for her. He, he would have laid hand. So Jesus would have prayed for him. Maybe she thought Jesus would have laid hands on Lazarus. I don't know. Maybe she was attaching some blame nonetheless. I don't know. Maybe I'm reading too much here into the text. But as I said in relation to Martha's statement earlier, this is what some people do. They blame God. And we, we talk to folk about Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Saviour of the world. And, and all their mindset seems to be on bringing up some problem, some difficulty, some thing where they're blaming God for their circumstances. This is what happens. Verse 33. When Jesus therefore saw her weeping, and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and was troubled. We've looked at this before more than once, two or three or four times, about the compassion of Jesus. Jesus was moved. He had feelings. He was a man who had feelings and he was God who had feelings. Yes, God has feelings and we, we can please God with our attitude, with our character with the things that we say and do, we can please God or we can displease God. We can disappoint Almighty God by the things that we do and say and by our attitudes and, and just generally our sinfulness. When we exhibit that in whatever form that is, we can disappoint. We do disappoint God. Jesus had compassion. He doesn't say that here in the text exactly, but he was deeply moved in spirit and was troubled and said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. Verse 35. Some people know that as the shortest verse in the Bible, and that's true. 
but it doesn't matter whether it's the shortest verse or not. Verses, verse numbers were not in the original text as we know. Some people even use that expression, Jesus wept, as some sort of exclamation or almost as a, as a, as a curse phrase. They, they use it totally out of context and it's blasphemous when they do that. There we are, that's what people do. But it just shows Jesus wept, he had tears. So the Jews were saying, behold, how you loved him. And that verb there is the filio verb. How you um, had some had ad adoration for him. How you were fond of him. But some of them said, could not this man who opened the eyes of him who was blind have kept this man also from dying? Well, there we are also. Whether or not Martha and Mary blamed Jesus, and I've been through, maybe they did, maybe they didn't. Here the people, in verse 37, they were blaming Jesus, saying, Could not this man who opened the eyes of him who was blind have kept this man also from dying? Rather like, wasn't it Satan, in the temptation of Jesus, testing him, tempting him, prodding him, challenging him? If you are the Son of God, if, if you are the Son of God... Similar sort of theme, I, I suggest here. Verse 38, Jesus therefore again being deeply moved within. This absolutely shows the love of the Lord Jesus, doesn't it? Came to the tomb. Now it was a cave and a stone was lying against it. Jesus said, remove the stone. Martha, the son of the deceased, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be a stench. For he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not say to you, If you believe, you will see the glory of God? Same verb there, pistuio. Maybe not how you pronounce it, I do apologise. But that's the verb. Did I not say to you, If you believe, if you trust, if you have confidence, if you rely, you will see the glory of God? That's... Us as born again Christians, we trust, we place reliance, we believe, we place our confidence in the Lord Jesus and we, we see a glimpse of the glory of God at some points in our lives. Part of the glory of God, one aspect very important, is that he has taken those who are born again from being destitute, poor in spirit, from being dead in their trespasses and sins, of being not in the favour of God. God has taken people and has take, make, made them into a new creation, has given them a rebirth. And he, God, has come to indwell the Christian by his Holy Spirit. That's something of the glory of God. That's miraculous. And miracles show the glory of God. True miracles in the name of Jesus, when they're performed by Jesus as they were, and in the name of Jesus, yes, even still today, they show something of the glory of God. And so they removed the stone and Jesus raised his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you heard me. And I know that you heard that you hear me always. But because of the people standing around, I said it so that they may believe, that word again, that you did send me. And when he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. He who had died came forth, bound hand and foot with wrappings, and his face was wrapped around with a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. That's verses 1 through to 44, which was the text we were given today. Unbind him. Yeah, well, that's a physical state of affairs and people would have physically unwrapped him, unbound him. Doesn't that represent the spiritual transaction, the spiritual event which takes place when someone comes from darkness into light, comes from being bound up with sorts of problems and addictions, being bound up in the system of the world and Scripture tells us that the evil one, the devil, is the ruler of the world. 
the world system. He's the prince of the power of the air. He's the God of this age. And people who are not born again Christians, they are bound up in the devil's kingdom. It, it, it is as simple as that. But God doesn't want that to remain your status quo. If you listening to this, watching this, if you're not a born again Christian, there is an easy way of escape. Is it easy? Well, it takes your understanding and trust and faith in Jesus. Faith is a gift from God. Ask God for the faith to believe in what I've just been talking about from Scripture. Ask God to give you the faith to place your life in the hands of Jesus Christ. And then as Lazarus was physically unbound and given life, so you can be unbound and given life eternal.